uh, when I left the Kurds as a going away gift, they gave me a hand grenade. And um, it didn't, it wasn't, they explained, they showed me a little hole in it. It was, the powder was taken out. So it's not dangerous, you know, there's no, oh, thank you, you know, it's one of those polytest things. Oh, very nice. So just to tell you the state of air travel, those days, I went back to Tehran and I got on an airplane to go to Beirut and, and I had this hand grenade in my pocket. I never thought once about it. And the, the strange end of the story, it was in, in Beirut airport, I put my coat down somewhere and I came back and the coat had disappeared with a hand grenade in the pocket. <laughs> You know, there's a lot of great storytelling that goes on in journalistic circles and bars and things. That, that's always a reliable one. <laughs> and, of course, the, the, most of the Kurds are, are Muslims, although there are remnants of the Chaldean Christians, which go way, way back. And um, these groups of people living together for centuries, they find ways of working it out. It's okay, it doesn't seem to be a problem, but some people come in from the outside and they try to start rearranging the furniture and that's when the trouble starts. They're, they're standing on top of their house. The, it's hard to see here, but the roof of one house becomes the balcony of, of the one uh, above it. And uh, this is uh, the British when they got to uh, 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 Aden, South Arabia, the British were having an election. The British were, that was their last bit of empire east of Suez. So their last act was to have an election to prove that they had democratized the place. It sounds familiar in a way. Um, but, uh, so this is one of the guys voting with a, he didn't speak, uh, couldn't read Arabic, so they had pictures on, on the, his voting. And this is, uh, this is a, a mother and her son in Gaza. Um, he'd been wounded in the first intifada. And this is all in the West Bank. Uh, somebody's digging up the translation of whatever the writing is on the wall. I don't actually know what it is. This is a, a Palestinian farmer in the West Bank. And amid all the political stories, more interesting to me, and here is, he has, that's his family, and all these women are looking at him, and, and the sheep, is, he's got all these responsibilities, and that's really what is on his mind. It's the inner family tensions that are really the thing that most people are really about. The politics are far away. And this is Jordan, it, it, it's Jerusalem. It was in Jordan when I photographed it. And then it became in Israel, and it's, it's supposed to be partly Palestinian. And um, it's been 3,000 years, and there's lots of others who have claimed it. So writing a caption can be kind of complicated. This is Isfahan, Iran. This is Yazd, Iran. There's a prevalence of those arched shapes in this part of the world. This is the only color picture I'm showing tonight. It has an interesting story behind it. Uh, actually, some of these were later journeys. And my wife, Ula, who's sitting there in the blue shirt, uh, we went there in 1998, and I ended up with a bunch of black and white small black and white prints as, as proofs. And I somehow neglected to fix them properly in the chemistry. And I looked at them 10 years later, like three years ago, and they'd started to fade and acquire this strange chemical color. And I thought, oh my gosh, I'm poor technique. And then I saw this one, I loved what happened to it. It acquired this patina of color. And um, so to, to stop the change, I scanned it immediately, and then I began making photograph, uh, uh, print, prints of it. And um, it, it has this 
interesting old-timey 19th century look. It's actually on our dining room wall about this big. And I don't know if you can see the one thing that proves that it's not 19th century. I thought I might sell this picture to Adidas or something, but somebody said those aren't Adidas, so I forgot about it. Well, from, from the Middle East, I moved on to London, and I lived there three years, and I, I, I loved living in London. I'll, I'll read my text on, text on London. The title of this section is Eyes in the Street, and that comes from a poem by T.S. Eliot. <clears throat> Whereas Manhattan for me had begun and ended within one sharply defined neighborhood, the Lower East Side, London was more like life in a traffic circle. I lived upstairs over a cafe on Shaftesbury Avenue near Pic Piccadilly Cir Circus. The number 24, 22, and 19 buses stopped right below my window. People riding on the upper deck were only a few feet from my second floor breakfast table. But with British discretion, their eyes seemed not to notice my American stare. I tried to photograph them without success. I was tempted to adopt England as my own. My British friendships proved to be few, but lifelong. These were somehow an object lesson in this parliamentary democracy's ability to span a huge, potentially discordant diversity, just as it once bestrode a worldwide empire. I became a godfather in Salisbury Cathedral, Forty years later, I would return to the christening of his son in a village near Salisbury. The 60s were an exciting time to be in a London poised between bowler-hatted bankers, Beatles fans, Carnaby Street, and the still widespread impoverishment of post-war England. The B British Museum and National Gallery were five minutes from my flat. I could spontaneously spend half an hour with Chinese bronzes or with Titian or with Modigliani and Cezanne over at the Courtauld. Some Sundays I sat in playing clarinet in traditional jazz pubs. Many of my assignments were for Fairchild, publisher of Women's Wear Daily and other New York newspapers. Because fashions were being set in London before arriving in Manhattan six months later, it was vital for folks in New York's rag trade to see what was being worn on the streets of London. I roamed chic Chelsea, posh Mayfair, the no-nonsense city, playing paparazzi to the pedestrians. Or I would accompany a correspondent to interview with movie stars. Um, and I always have tried to kind of look behind the surface of things and look be, I found actors hard to photograph many times because the actors want to give you the surface and and you're supposed to take that, but I was always trying to find my way around. So sometimes there's these tensions would arise. Um, uh, David Niven particularly got very impatient with me and complained to the correspondent I was with. He says he keeps taking pictures when I don't want him to, because he was a, he's a great actor, but a master presenting these series of faces, and I, I wanted to take pictures right in between the two faces he was presenting. Um, they. They wanted me to photograph Catherine Hepburn, who's working on a film in southern France, um, The Lion in Winter, with Peter O'Toole. And I did some research before I went all the way down there, and I found out she never, ever uh, allows herself to be photographed uh, during a filming. And she's in a position, like few in Hollywood, that could get away with it. Most of them probably have publicity in their contracts. They said, well, go anyway, see what you can get. So I went anyway, and I was about 300 yards away from when they, she finished shooting, and she was going across this empty space. And she looked my way, and I could feel the daggers, the cold, I mean, there was no way. And the, she had the whole people, all the people working on the film, she had them terrified. They brought pictures from the film and things. They said, how would you like to interview Peter O'Toole instead? He loves to be interviewed. So I said, well. To myself, I said, maybe he'll tell me something she said, because so, that's what I was sent there to find out. So we, he, he liked to drink a lot. And every day after, um, after um, he was finished work, we'd sit there for three or four nights and get half plastered. And he just wanted somebody to talk to. And he sort of halfway knew what I was. He dropped things in, tell me, like, well, this day we were just doing shots from the waist up. 
and Kate's feet hurt, so she was wearing these old tennis shoes because it wasn't going to show. She had this regal gown, and, ten and I, he said, uh, they're so old, I, he said, I turned to her and said, Kate, they also come in white. So <laughs> women's wear daily loved that quote. So sometimes you have to kind of bounce with the tide. <laughs> uh, okay. Back in my darkroom in teeming working class leather lane, I developed a film then rushed it to the Fairchild Bureau near Buckingham Palace to be air freighted to Manhattan. I took off to France to cover the Winter Olympics to Holland for a geographical story and around the world for TWA's uh, annual report. Paradoxically, I was often lonely. Had I had a model for those London years, it could have been a line from one of T.S. Eliot's dark London hymns. I have seen eyes in the street. Here are a few pictures from England. That's the British Museum. And I th think it's pretty obvious that the guy in the back is, is, gives the human touch to it. <laughs> These are children on the street in a, an area of North London called Highgate. And they could be children in many places. But I think of them as pairs. It's kind of amazing. It's two by two by two. And there's even two baby carriages in it. And it's, it's, it's half luck and half alertness when you catch things like that. Uh, this, is a, uh, this is an actor named Richard Harris. And he was completely unlike the ones who just wanted to present you with a face. And uh, we had a great time, and he had his kid there. And I, I don't know if you remember, Richard Harris was in many, many epic films and on the stage and all that. And this is, lady is the mayor of Salisbury. And I just love English hats. I mean, <laughs> they may be stuffy in some ways, but boy, can they do hats. <laughs> And those are two colonial types behind her, the, the wig. I also ran down to Spain and was to see a friend, uh, a couple of friends down there. And these were a couple of parts of Spain which were uh, off the tourist beat. I always try to flee from tourist areas. That's really old Spain. So then, um, I, Sunset Books, just here in Menlo Park, asked me to come to California and do a book on ghost towns of the West. Sunset had, it was a magazine that was rapidly expanding in the pictorial book field. And um, for me, that was a great assignment. I was really interested in doing longer term projects rather than short, shorter term ones. And um, so I, I think I'll read you that page. That actually began, a, I moved back here to do that, and that began a series of projects in parts of the United States. Um, to me, I was trying to evoke the national character in some ways. The, the mining towns, the ghost towns that Sunset wanted me to do were kind of a remnant of of a, the gold rush past and the, way, the quick way people would make money and then the whole thing would collapse and they'd run on to something else. That's part of our Western heritage, and many other parts, of course. I traveled widely across America, searching out strands of the national character and of myself. I drove a four-wheel drive camper truck over the back roads of 10 states, looking for creaking ghost towns and the histories of those who had inhabited them the rough and ready miners who blasted open the far west following the gold rush, helping shape who we are as a people. By the way, my stepson Jeff is back there. He went with me on a couple of those. <laughs> we almost got stuck in the middle of Salt Lake. <laughs> That's another story, many other stories. 